welcome. Come on in, have a seat. We will get started here. It is good to see you all today. Beautiful Sunday morning. If you would like to enjoy this afternoon, uh, I, I hope working outdoor. Where, where's Ed? Ed, you guys going to be outdoors or indoor? Say outdoors. For the maze. Outdoors? Building outdoors? Oh, open the windows then at least. All right. Uh, Ed is looking for some help this afternoon to build the maze, the uh, traditional annual maze for Vacation Bible School. So if you can do that, you can join Ed in the uh, back room. I think that's room five at one o'clock this afternoon, right? One o'clock? Great. Well, today is our last message from the letter of 1 Timothy. And uh, when August rolls around, we'll start into the letter of 2 Timothy. It'll sound a lot like 1 Timothy, just a warning, okay? There's a lot of themes that are repeated there. But uh, this is our last one for this letter. Hope it's been enriching to you as it has been for me. Let's read our primary text today, and then we'll dig into our topic. We're going to be looking at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19, where the Apostle Paul writes, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all good things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Our primary point this morning is simply that we have a task, a challenge, an opportunity, whatever word you want to fill into the blank, to balance our earthly wealth and the generation and the storage of that wealth with generosity and trying to find a way to keep God in the middle of all of that. It's, uh, it's an interesting topic, and fortunately, uh, today was the day that we had selected to kick off our um, Acts 4 campaign, and so it blended nicely that we're going to be talking today about how you can be generous to your uh, brothers and sisters in Christ while fulfilling an opportunity of Scripture that Paul describes here to Timothy. So before we get too far into this, I want to go back to last weekend to the church retreat because I want to, I want to steal a word that Kurt used from uh, his teaching on the end times. So as long as we're going back there, for those of you that joined us last weekend, a little pop quiz here, okay? We want to see what you remember a week later. So uh, Ben taught, Kurt taught, and I taught. We'll start with Ben. Ben taught uh, first that weekend. Uh, ben continued his series on uh, the roles and responsibilities of men and women in their marriage, specifically um, the spirit or character of our wives. And Ben talked about two um, parts of a woman's character. Any remembrances of what those were? Let me help you out, okay? Um, your wife should not be desiring to lead your family out of two character traits, bad character traits. Jera, the first one. Anger, close, but... Oh, fear, fear. Ding, 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 fear. Good. Okay, number two. Bitterness. How do we do, Ben? All right, excellent. Now, Kurt taught on Saturday, and Kurt only repeated, I think, eight times during his message that if you want to take somebody to Scripture to have an accurate understanding of what is going to happen during the sequence of end times events, you would take them where? Book and chapter. How do we do, Kurt? All right. All right, and then on Sunday morning, um, we talked about Paul instructing Timothy to do uh, two things, two key words as it relates to the gifts that God has given to us. One of those words, um, describe the gift, it starts with an E, and the other word starts with a G. Any guesses? Interesting. No, that's not one, Ann. Entrusted, thank you. And what do we do with what's been entrusted to us? We guard it, thank you very much. All right, so good job, guys. 
Um, I don't know, were those messages recorded last week? They were. Okay, so we don't have to remember it all. We can go back and watch it if you need to. Perfect. And if you weren't able to join us at the retreat, we'd encourage you to catch those messages and perhaps consider joining us uh, next June when we head back up to Cedar Falls. So the word that I want to steal today is a word that Kurt used to describe what it's like to try to balance what's happening today versus the possibility in our lifetime of those end times events unfolding. The word that Kurt used was tension. There's a tension between how we live for today and how we plan for tomorrow. If we were absolutely convinced that Jesus Christ would return literally today, perhaps during this service. Now, that, that can't happen because we haven't seen the unfolding of all the other end times events that are going to occur between now and then. But let's just say, circumstantially, that Jesus was going to return today, tomorrow, this week, okay? We'd probably live our lives a little bit differently then we're planning to live our life this week, aren't we? I tell you what, uh, no offense to my employer, but I wouldn't be going to work this week if I knew the sequence of end times events was starting this week, then I probably wouldn't be showing up to punch the clock from 7.30 to 5 o'clock Monday through Friday this coming week. I'll bet there are things that you would do differently this coming week as well if you knew that the end times was at hand. The challenge is that we don't know if the end times are at hand this week, do we? The entire sequence of end times events could happen during our lifetime. Or we could be like the believers of the last 2,000 years and not see the sequence of end times events happen during our lifetime. We just don't know. What we do know And what we trust, because Scripture tells us so, is that it's possible. And because it's possible, we should live and plan in such a way that it could happen. And if we're living and planning in such a way that it could happen, then that means there's a certain amount of preparation that we need to take, while also living as though our lives will be relatively uninterrupted between now and the day that we die. You see that tension? How do I plan for something that could happen and plan for something that may not happen? Um, The reason I'm stealing that word today is because I believe that the text that we're looking at today is very, very similar. And the idea of how we plan financially for today and the generosity that Christ calls us to today can have conflict or tension or seemingly have tension with planning for our own financial futures. That, that R word that some of us think about from time to time, retirement. So again, let's, uh, let's dig in here, talk about how that might work for us individually. There's a tension between earthly wealth and heavenly riches, or there can appear to be attention. So let's be specific. What do I mean by tension? Let's ask this question of ourselves. You may think two or three of these questions are silly, but I'd like to have you literally think about these. Ask them rhetorically of yourself. Question number one, is it biblical to save money? Is it biblical to save money? If so, how much? And for what? And if saving money comes at the expense of giving to the needs of others, am I in sin if I save money? How would I know whether I am or not? Similar question, is it biblical to spend money on myself? If so, how much? And for what? And if spending money on myself comes at the expense of giving to the needs of others, am I in sin if I spend? And how would I know? Can I enjoy my money when I use it for things that someone else might view as extravagant? Like a new house, or a new car, or a boat, or a really good fishing reel to catch Northern Pike next week. 
or remodeling of a kitchen or a bathroom? How much is too much to spend on those things? And if using money for those things comes at the expense of giving to others that are in need, am I in sin if I spend that money? And how would I know? You see, these are, <laughs> these are pretty complicated questions, aren't they? And I feel tension when I try to answer those questions. And I try to balance what is it that Jesus wants me to know and what is it that Jesus wants me to do in light of what Jesus describes about our attitude concerning our finances. In fact, some of this tension is either further, even further complicated by some of what Scripture has to say. Let's look at four or five examples and see if you feel the same way I do after reading these. Matthew chapter 19, Jesus says, if you wish to be perfect, some translations use the word complete. If you wish to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. <laughs> Picture that for a moment. The camel through the eye of a needle. That's not just difficult. That's absolutely impossible. It is impossible for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. So what is Jesus saying here? Well, what Jesus is literally saying is if you wish to be perfect, if you wish to be complete in your faith, Go sell what you have and give it away to those in need. In Mark chapter 12, this is repeated in two other gospels. Jesus writes, a poor widow came in and put in two small copper coins, which amount literally to a cent. Truly I say to you, Jesus says, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury, for they put in out of their surplus, but she out of her poverty. She put in all she owned and all she had to live on. What does Jesus imply? That this extremely small gift that this woman had was greater than the gift that all the other people gave as they walked by, even though their gift was literally larger. But for her, because it was a sacrifice of everything that she had, Jesus points out how special and unique that gift was. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus says, so then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all of his own possessions. You cannot be my disciple if you don't give up everything that you have. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth or rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. Finally, Luke sa uh, Jesus says in Luke chapter 12, sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourselves money belts which do not wear out. An unfailing treasure in heaven where no, no thief comes in or moth destroys. What is the implication of everything that Jesus has said? Give it away. No exception. One of those references there was from a, a well-known story uh, that is usually titled in your Bibles as the story of the rich young ruler. You remember that story? There's a, a man who was a devout Jew, and he's in a crowd at listening to Jesus teach. And he approaches Jesus at some point in time, maybe just after that teaching, and he says, well, Jesus, I have kept all of the law. And... Jesus' first response before Jesus says anything to this man is that Jesus had compassion on him. What that indicates to me is that this quote-unquote rich young ruler as he came to Jesus was not just a devout Jew who wanted to keep the law because it was the right thing to do, but is a devout Jew that loved God. Because Jesus looked at that man and Jesus didn't look at that man and think the same thing that Jesus thought of the Pharisees when they came. Remember, Jesus often called the Pharisees hypocrites, right? What's on the inside, Jesus said, is not the same as what we see on the outside. Jesus didn't say that to the rich young ruler. The text says that Jesus first 
had compassion on this man. And then Jesus delivers the blow, right? Jesus says to this young man, you have to be willing to sell everything that you have. Do so, come and follow me. And the text in the Gospels describes that this young man went home sorrowful, sad, because he wasn't able to do that. I imagine, the text does not tell us, but I imagine the possibility that this young man might have been a business owner. Maybe he had a business set up. He had employees. He had responsibilities on a daily basis that he had to fulfill in order to generate the wealth that he had, perhaps. And so when Jesus says, go and sell everything that you have, that's what you need to do to come and follow me. Jesus was essentially describing to this man that he wanted him to do exactly what Jesus' apostles did. You remember when Jesus went to his selected 12, every single one of them did exactly that. The fishermen put down their nets and followed Jesus immediately. The tax collector left his booth and followed Jesus immediately. That's what Jesus asked of his closest disciples. That perhaps is exactly what Jesus asked of the rich young ruler. But that man whom Jesus had compassion on was not able to do what Jesus asked. And so it's an, the epitome of what we see as the culmination of all of these phrases that Jesus uses to describe following him. And that is that we have to be willing and able to deny those things that are treasures to us here on this earth. In fact, so much so that Jesus unequivocally says, sell it, give it away, get rid of it. His words are really clear. So you see the tension? Do you feel the tension? Because none of us in this room, at least to my knowledge, none of us in this room have actually done what Jesus said. And so you might read that and start to feel some conviction. Like, am I not doing all that Jesus is asking me to do? Well, let me give you just a little bit of balance on the other side of the equation. And frankly, there isn't a lot. There isn't a lot of balance. That's what we're seeking. But here's a couple of examples. Perhaps my most favorite example is the example that we find in the book of Genesis about the life of Joseph. You remember Joseph, who was sold into slavery in the nation of Egypt, rises up through the ranks of the Pharaoh and essentially is the sec second command of all of Egypt. Joseph received a direct revelation from God. What was that revelation? Joseph, go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh that there is a famine that's coming to all of this region, including to the nation of Egypt. It would be prudent, Joseph, to tell the Pharaoh to set aside 20% of all the crops that are grown in the next seven years. You set those aside and Egypt will flourish during the drought that's coming. And of course, because that was a direct revelation from God, Joseph took that word to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said, Joseph, you're such a wise man. That's exactly what we're going to do. And the nation of Egypt prospered during a time where severe drought and famine was in the land. What's the moral of that story besides we'd all love to receive direct divine revelation from God so we can plan accordingly, right? That's moral of the story number one. Moral of the story number two is that we can infer that there are appropriate times in our life to save for times in our life in the future where our finances, our uh, needs may not be as well met, okay? Here's a second um, inference from Scripture. In Malachi chapter 3, we read uh, about the tithe and God's commandment through the prophet Malachi to the nation of Israel. By the way, up until this point in time, particularly in um, Leviticus and Numbers, the books of the law of the Old Testament, we can see about 15 or so references to the tithe and to God's desire, God's design, that the nation of Israel would give a tenth of all that they grew, of all that they had to him on an annual basis. Uh, the literal Hebrew word there um, is the word masra, and it means a tenth. So there's no mistaking what it is that God was asking. 
In Malachi chapter 3, we read, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. God is attempting, as he has over and over and over again through the prophets, to restore, to bring back the nation of Israel to himself. Now, we know that God knows that wasn't going to happen, right? Because we see the rest of the story. We know that God knew that in order for the nation of Israel to be restored to himself, Jesus Christ was going to have to be born and be used as the restoration project to bring Israel eventually back to himself. But God is encouraging through Malachi, as he does through many of the prophets, speak to the nation of Israel, implore them to turn from their wicked ways and to come back to me. One of the ways that God instructs that this can be done is by bringing into the storehouse the tenth or the tithe. Now, what's the inference here? I think the inference is that God was not asking for 100% of all that they had, was he? He wasn't asking for 90 or 80 or 70 or 60 or 50 or 40 or 30 or 20 of everything they had. God specifically was asking for 10% of all that they had. So the inference to me is this. God said, you get to keep the other 90. I only want this part. You can have this part. And you can do with that what seems right to you to do, whether it's to save it or to spend it, or perhaps even to give it away. Now, I realize that that's, um, I'm interpreting some scripture here that isn't direct. What we know from the Old Testament is how God intended for the tithe to be given. And it was really to even benefit the nation of Israel. It's not like it came into God's storehouse and sat there and rotted. It was actually used for the nation of Israel, specifically for the tribe of Levite, those that served in the house of the Lord. That food that was brought in fed the priests of the nation of Israel. So there was even purpose and earthly usefulness to the tithe that was being given to God. The point of all this is to say, let me go backwards about seven minutes here. The point is this, Jesus is really clear about how he wants us to have a perspective about our money, about our finances, about our generosity. And if we look for an equal amount of balance on the other side of the equation, my friends, we are not going to find it. We just aren't. And that's why I think this is a topic that has the potential to be filled with some tension. Let's read 1 Timothy chapter 6 again. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all good things to enjoy. Instruct them, instruct us, instruct the church to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. So what do we do with all of this? I was talking with a a couple in our church this past week about some things related to this topic. Questions like, well, how much do we give and how much do we save and how do we go about saving and what what would be uh, appropriate to spend on this, that, and the other? And after we talked for a couple of hours, I summarized our whole conversation by saying this, I can't give you an answer to your question. I'd love to be able to. I'd love to be able to point at something really specific and say, this is black and white, and here's the percentage, and here's what you can do, and here's what you can't do. Just go do it and please the Lord. But I couldn't do that, and the reason that I couldn't do that is because each of us individually will have to involve our conscience in how we follow and obey what Jesus has asked of us. That begins as Paul writes to Timothy with this phrase. Remember that God is the good provider of it all. What does Paul say? Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches. Do not be conceited. What does it mean to be conceited? It means to think, I know the absolute best way 
to provide for myself and I don't need you or you or you or you to help me with that. Paul says, don't be that guy. What does Paul say secondly? He says, also, don't fix your hope on the uncertainty of riches. I work in an environment, in a career that helps people build riches. Every day, for better or for worse, I can probably tell you what happened in the stock market. And I can tell you exactly what's happened in the stock market this year. But I don't have to tell you. Most of you know what's happened in the stock market this year. Not just the stock market, but in the, if you're into Bitcoin and in, in cryptocurrency market, if you're into various kinds of futures in futures markets, like just about any way that you measure, measure the value of currency, we've had a pretty steep decline this year. It's a great example of what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, that if we're fixing our hope on the uncertainty of riches, those riches that go up and down in value, and I may have them today, but I may not have them tomorrow, if we're that person well, we're going to have a, a real practical problem. And that is that we may not have our money at the time that we want our money. But the bigger problem we have is not a practical problem. The bigger problem we have is a spiritual problem. And the spiritual problem is that I'm not really relying on God. I'm relying what I put into my cryptocurrency account. I say my, I don't have one, okay? But our cryptocurrency account. Where's uh, Fred? Maybe we should look into that for new life. Cryptocurrency, <laughs> 2022. Let's meet and discuss. We don't want to be the conceited person that is relying on ourselves, where we believe it's all up to us because what Paul says is it's not up to you. It's God who richly blesses and provides and supplies us with all the things that we enjoy. We don't want to be the person who fixes their hope on currencies that go up and down, not only because it's not a practical thing to do, but because it's spiritually not advisable. If we try to answer the question, how do we know that we're in sin relative to those previous questions that I asked about how do we decide what we spend and what we save and what we give? Well, I think we could plainly see that when we reach the point that we're relying on ourselves and we're fixing our hope on things that we believe that we can control, we've crossed the line into sin. There it is. Paul says, whatever you have, give credit to God. It comes from him. Now, what does it mean to think about the blessing of being generous? The word generosity means to give a share of. And the word share in this verse, instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Ready to share, that word right there is the word koinonia in Greek. You've probably heard that word before. Koinonia simply means to be in Christian fellowship with one another. It's interesting that Paul uses that in the context of this verse. What does Paul say we should be ready to share? How does he define fellowship? The sharing that Paul is talking about here is not getting together in a Barnabas group and sharing our burdens. The example that Paul is using here is getting together as a church and sharing what you have that will benefit other people. Paul in this verse describes true Christian fellowship, koinonia, as being ready to to share with others, to share what with others? Our good works, our riches. You see, good works and generosity is not just financial, but there's a piece of it that is financial. Our finances are certainly a part of experiencing the koinonia, the fellowship that Christ wants his church to have. Paul says to Timothy, instruct them to do this. So, from time to time, the pastors of New Life Community Church have the privilege of giving a teaching that has to do with money. And it probably makes us all just a 
teeny wee bit uncomfortable. And maybe it makes some of us really uncomfortable. But I want you to know that Paul says to Timothy, instruct them in this manner. Just like all of scripture, we have a responsibility to have this conversation with each other. And even more than that, I hope you catch from this verse, the leaders of your church have a responsibility to help you to create ways for you to be generous. That's what Paul says here. Instruct the church to do good, to be rich in good works, and to be generous and ready to share. So leaders, instruct the church and give them opportunity to express their generosity to one another. We have a responsibility here at New Life Community Church of helping you experience the blessing of being generous. And that's why one of our core purposes here at New Life, one of four, is that we are a place to give. We don't talk about New Life Community Church being a place to give as being any less significant than a place to be saved, a place to belong, and a place to grow. We talk about them equally because they're all part of the Christian life. And so as we think here in our church, in our fellowship, about what it means to give, we often remind ourselves that giving can come in various forms. It comes in what John Gross was describing earlier, the giving of our time to volunteer, sometimes even to do activities that you don't think are in your wheelhouse in order to benefit your church family. It comes in the sacrifice of your intellect. It comes in the sacrifice of time willing to spend with people who are in need. It comes in the form of your spiritual life when you're praying for those who hurt, those who are in spiritual need in our church. And it comes in the form of our finances, what we're willing to give in order to benefit the fellowship here at New Life, to experience that koinonia. And that's one of the reasons, it's the primary reason, why we have the Acts 4 Fund that we're kicking off today um, of contributions for. Now, what is the Acts 4 Fund? Well, the Acts 4 Fund, the impetus of it comes from the book of Acts, chapter 4. We have this beautiful depiction in Acts chapter 4, three verses of what was happening in the first century church after Christ died and rose and Peter and the apostles are beginning to preach the word of God. We read, the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. And this is the 34th verse specifically. For there was not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as they had need. Beautiful picture of the kind of fellowship that Christ wants for his church. And that's why the Acts 434 Fund is called the Acts 434 Fund. It is an attempt, a program, if you would, to allow you to be generous, to fulfill the needs of your brothers and sisters in Christ. We went back in the records this past week to 2019 and uh, looked at some of the different ways that money has been spent out of the Acts 434 fund. So I could share that with you today. Here are just a few of the categories. And I'm, I'm using these broadly because I, it's not my intention to point out a very specific need for a specific person that we fulfilled, okay? But here are some things that we helped with. Uh, we paid a lot of rent bills. We paid down payments on getting into apartments. We bought a lot of food, medical bills, gasoline for vehicles that were on empty. We paid for legal bills, car repairs, COVID and unemployment relief, derecho recovery, Furnace and air conditioning issues, wedding expenses, fire victims, paid for some air flights, and a lot of other personal items. All of those were distributed 
as legitimate needs from your brothers and sisters were expressed to the pastors. Since 2019, we've spent more than $40,000 out of that fund. That's what that adds up to. More than $40,000. And I'm sure that there were many needs that we couldn't meet because they went unexpressed, right? Because we don't like to ask. One of the operating desires here of the pastor is something we talk about on a regular basis when it comes to church finances is that we want to be a conduit for money to go from you to ministry. We don't want to hold that in reserve. We don't want to be a reservoir of your money. We want to be a river of your money. We want to pass it along. We want to invest it where it can be invested in good things. And one of those good things that we get to invest in is each other in each other's needs. And you did that 40,000 times over in the last three years. And we thank you for that. Our Acts 4 fund is intentionally empty. We've spent it as we have designed to do. And so we want to take the opportunity here over the next three or four weeks to replenish that fund. And again, to give you an opportunity to be generous, to fulfill what Paul writes to Timothy about the glory and the joy of generosity and to invest the riches of this life in something that's meaningful in this life that also has eternal value, eternal purpose, laying the foundation of that which is good and is to come. It leaves us with the question, though, that we, we still have to ask or have to ponder, and that is, well, what should I give? And what does it mean to be generous? And again, I am not going to answer that question for you today. But let me give you some guidelines. Okay? Uh, you see here uh, a timeline of sorts. Over on the far left side, circle on the left side, is giving nothing. I honestly don't know if there's anybody here at New Life Community Church that gives nothing. Pastors do not look at our giving statements. We don't know what each individual family unit gives here at New Life. Fred, Fred's got the magic key to that, okay? So maybe there are people here today that are over here on the far left side. And if that describes you, the intention here is not to shame you, but the intention would be to help you, to help you be more generous, to help you have a spiritual perspective about your riches on earth versus your riches in heaven. I believe that God would ask you, if you're on this far left side, to work to the right side. You see the next circle there is the tenth, the tithe. I would say that if God required that of his people in the Old Testament, and really the only thing that Jesus comes along and says in the New Testament really explicitly is, go beyond that, sell everything, then it doesn't, how could we say it negates what God asked of us in the Old Testament? We have no foundation for negating that commandment of God. What we have is evidence that Jesus wants us only to add to it and to do so cheerfully. So if you're over here on the far left side up to the 10th or the tithe, my encouragement to you would be work towards the tithe, work that direction. Perhaps use the Acts 430 fund as, 434 fund as an opportunity to move you closer to where you're fulfilling that Old Testament commandment of our Father. Now, for those that might be at the tithe and, and you're really happy being there, and by the way, you should be, you're you're fulfilling a desire that I believe that God has for you. But I want to ask you as well, can we move beyond there? Can we become less content with feeling like we check that box and desire to seek giving more away? Moving farther and farther to the right, where if we take Jesus' words literally, we would sell everything to follow him. So am I asking you to sell everything today? I am not asking for that. 
maybe I should. But if I asked it of you, I would ask it of me, and I'm not ready to do that. Honestly. Maybe that means that my faith is not perfect. That my faith is not complete. Remember, that's what Jesus said if, to the rich young ruler. If you want to be complete, this is what you'll do. And maybe that's evidence that I am not complete in the way that I think of my own finances, in the way that I balance that tension between today and the future. So I'm not asking this of anybody in this room, though perhaps Jesus might ask it of us someday, and we'd have to respond to him. What I am asking is, would you consider moving from the left side to the right side? And would you consider a lifestyle of continuing to move from the left side to the right side. Is a tenth generous? Well, it was God's expectation. Is it still? I believe that it is. Responding to the needs of others, is that generous? Yes. How generous do I need to be? I don't know. It's not for me to say, to tell you how generous that you need to be. Is selling everything generous? Absolutely, if it's done for the glory of God. Is it necessary for you to do that today? That's not for me to say. However, I would say this. If you came to the pastors today and said, you know what, I'm compelled by Christ that I want to follow him in that way. I want to sell everything. I don't think any of us would say to you anything more than count the cost, and if that's your conscience, you need to follow your conscience. In other words, it would not be unwise to follow the example of Christ, as extreme as it sounds, particularly in 2022 in the United States of America. So, our guide is simply this for this morning. What should I give and what is generosity? Can you simply do more? Whatever you've done in the past, can you do more? Have you given 5%? Could you give 6 can you move from 6% to 10%? Do you tithe now? Could you move to 12%? Could you move to 15%? Responding to the Acts 434 fund, could you look at what you've given in the past year, divide it by 12 and add one more month, 13 months of giving, one month of giving to the Acts 434 fund? Would you consider that? What we promise you is that uh, the Acts 434 fund is not going to be buying any of the pastors a new vehicle. Uh, none of us are moving into a bigger house. What it will do is help a brother or sister in Christ have an air conditioner this week. What it will do is make sure that a family can eat next week. What it will do is ensure that when other needs come in the future, in the next year, we have a way of responding to that in love, in koinonia fellowship. And in doing so, we will provide an opportunity for you that you will exercise to be generous and to balance your earthly wealth with generosity, with God being directly in the middle of it all. Paul says, instruct the church in these things. Don't be conceited. Don't depend on yourself. Put your trust in God. Now, I'm going to end with uh, Proverbs 11.25 here, because you can't have this conversation about money without bringing up a proverb, right? So here it is, Proverbs 11.25. A generous man will be prosperous, and he who waters will himself be watered. You see, when we are generous, it all comes back to us. It may not come back to you tomorrow or next week or next month or next year, but it will come back to you. You might have to wait until you're spending eternity with Christ Jesus for your generosity to come back to you. But my friend, it will. God promises that it will. So let's be the men and women who are watering, who are giving generously, and we will be watered too. Father, thank you for your generosity towards us. Thank you for expressing your love to us in uh, 
the unbelievable wealth that everybody in this room has, even by comparison to our neighbors who might appear to be much more wealthy than we are, Lord, we are rich. And I pray for myself and for my friends here today that you would impress upon us an appropriate response to your word, that we might be generous in our spirit and generous in practice with how we love one another with our finances. Bless this Acts 434 fund that it might, first of all, and foremost, glorify you in the fellowship of New Life Community Church. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Have a God week. We'll see you next Sunday.